We're going to continue with this theme of adaptation, and uh, I'm delighted to work, welcome some beautiful music, which will segue <laughs> Sean as he dances onto the stage and sits down in this wonderful chair. <laughs> so this session is going to involve some smack talking, and I'll come back to that later on. <laughs> but we will start with, uh, I, I'd like Sean just to introduce Cognizant, because I think some people will be familiar with it, others won't. So let's sure. just give us sort of a couple no, of minutes. I'm happy to. And actually, I'm, I'm glad to see, I think there will be some familiar faces just because of the competitors in the room and also so many of our clients are in the room too. So thank you guys for being clients. Uh, Cognizant is a global provider of technology, uh, consulting and business process services. Uh, we're a $10 billion Fortune 500 company. Uh, we've grown 30% Kager for the last 20 years. Uh, so really phenomenal growth trajectory, and we've done it largely by kind of continuing to try to challenge ourselves to bring new offerings to the marketplace and find new ways to help our customers. And, and your core business is doing what, if just like in a sentence? Core business uh, is, is technology, systems integration, application development, application maintenance, testing, things like that. IT systems work. Got it. And, and major customer segments would be sort of financial services? Financial services, about 30% of our business, healthcare and life sciences, uh, and then retail, consumer goods, information media. So we are very vertically, vertically oriented in what we do. Got it. So I said we were going to do some smack talking. Uh, smack is your shorthand for the sort of forces that are driving digital disruption, Social, right? mobile, analytics, and cloud. It's a term we started using, uh, I don't know, probably close to five years ago. I think uh, it's probably no longer all-encompassing. Uh, I think, you know, you got factors like security and automation, and but we didn't want to make the acronym too long, so we've just stuck with it. <laughs> <laughs> I use DMCs, digital uh, wing users, digital me, uh, mobile and cloud, but someone told me that was run DMC and I'm going to get sued by the band before <laughs> too long, so I've stopped using that. Um, so you, you see these forces. Yeah. I mean, you guys have had this incredible growth vector, as you, as you said. Um, uh, where's it, uh, where are the risks for you? I mean, what, on the horizon when you, you look out there and you look at these forces, what, what could transform your business, what is transforming your business, in ways that could be very disruptive to the yeah. business model? So I think uh, on the, on the positive, I look at it in, in sort of two ways. And I think all these technologies kind of work together. I look at it in two ways. I think. Uh, what we've talked about in terms of digital transformation is a great opportunity for us. The risk there is, is inability to really capture it, and I think we've made some right. good investments to make sure that we have the data scientists, we have the experts in the Internet of Things, we have all of the experts that can help us seize that opportunity. Uh, I think the, the big force out there threatening to disrupt us is, is automation. Uh, a lot of the work we do is people-based, uh, and there's a lot of investment right now in robotic process automation and things like that, and that is a, a strong potential to disrupt the work that we and, and our counterparts, our competitors, do in the industry right now. Right. Um, and so you, how do you go about within Cognizant developing new, new ideas, new areas that will help you, you know, accelerate that already very fast growth yeah. that you're on? So, so we've made a very conscious effort when we go out and we talk about our strategy. Uh, we've we've stolen this, this model called the Three Horizons model. So we look at our business across three different horizons. Horizon one is our core business. Uh, that's the, the work I talked with you about, application development, testing, things like that. It's, uh, it's a, a business that still has a great growth trajectory. We're still making a lot of investments in it, but it's a mature business. It's a business that is stable and, and what our clients really know us for. Horizon 2 is the set of services that are, really have a lot of growth potential but haven't yet reached a saturation point in our marketplace, so there's still a lot of room for them to grow. Um, they're mature in the way we deliver them, but uh, we need to continue to scale them. And then Horizon 3, which is the world I'm responsible for at Cognizant, which is the bets we're placing on the future, the new things that we're investing in, the new ideas, the new concepts, whether it's analytics and data science or automation or, or platform-based services, those fall into this world. And, and we, we treat each one of those ideas, each one of those concepts as a startup unto itself that sits in this emerging business accelerator division that we run. And we, we do that to make sure that we allocate our resources first across the horizons and then within them. Because in big companies, as, as you guys all know, if, if you're going to have Horizon 3, these new and different offerings, try to compete with Horizon 1, these tried and true offerings, Horizon 1 typically wins every day, right? Because that's the thing that makes your quarterly numbers. That's the thing that pays off this month. Uh, so we've made that very conscious strategy to say we have a group that's specifically focused on Horizon 3, and those resources are only used for Horizon 3. Resources in terms of dollars and in terms of individuals as well. And the people that have decided to spend their careers there get protected and incentivized and measured in ways that the Horizon 1 business does not get measured by. So we try to strike that balance. So there's, there's a lot of things in there. Let me just try and unpack it. So for sure. a start, between 
between section two or sort of horizon two and horizon three, presumably it's not sort of black and white. It's 50 shades of, well, let's say 500 <laughs> shades of, 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 of red um, between those. Yeah. How, how do you decide what fits in that third bucket? Uh, versus the second one. I think, and I think what you'll see is that uh, it's not just between Horizon 2 and Horizon 3, it's actually between all the horizons. And in reality, uh, it's, this is a conceptual framework, but you can even look within a Horizon 1 service offering like testing, for example, and say, well, you know what, the, the people-based testing that we do sits in the Horizon 1 of Horizon 1, and then there's a Horizon 3 of Horizon right. 1, which is where they use testing automation. So it's not a black and white measure. Um, we try to look at the individual initiative and say, look, is this, a, regardless of where it sits organizationally, is this something that we want to protect as a Horizon 3 initiative? Got it. And, and so, and then you, you said that, so there, the, the people who are in your emerging business accelerator, they are protected. They're in some way, you use the term protection and sort of there's a special setup there. How does that, work? I mean, do you run yourself basically as a sort of pirate ship? off on the, the side? I mean, you're in the offices. Do, they, do these guys all wear sort of, and they're paid Special vast amounts tags, of money? We have handshakes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, how, does no. it, how do you differentiate? I mean, how do you, how do yeah. you work that? Yeah, it, it, so uh, to some extent, yes, they are, they are indicated separately in our, in our HR people management systems, right? So we can identify them as people working on a specific initiative. Um, I wouldn't use the pirate ship analogy simply because it conjures this idea that they're off on an island someplace and mm. separate from the rest of the business. One of the things we've said is with all of these things we're incubating, we want to protect the individuals on the team, but they have to maintain that connection back to the, the mothership if we want to keep using this, this boat analogy. Uh, the way we do that is for each one of these things we're incubating, we create a, a, a board of directors to govern it. And that board of directors is comprised of somebody from my team to make sure that they're protected, but also someone from our core business. So if it's a, a, banking, uh, a banking venture we're going after, building a new banking portal, or uh, in the process automation space, someone from our BPS business, that individual can sit on the board and help us both have the credibility of that marketplace and also gain access to their customers. So we try to balance those incentives to keep it aligned, but at the same time keep it protected. So, so every business has to have someone from a, another business line sitting on that board. Yep. And if someone says, well, you know, um, I, I want to talk about the term that should not be named, the Lord Voldemort term, you know, mm -hmm. automation. Yeah. We really should do automation. And you know what, actually, this could be very disruptive to almost every business line. Absolutely. So I'm not going to find a champion. How, how, how would you deal with, how do you deal with that? Or so, so far we've found champions. I mean, I think we really? have a great culture okay. where people are very forward looking. Automation is a great example where the head of our BPS business sits on the board with me and the two of us sit there and figure out how we push it into customers, how we get it through the field. I think, you know, I think for the most part our, our executives are, are forward looking enough to know that if we don't do automation, to, to pick on that one example, someone else is going to do it to us. So we'd rather, we'd rather do it first in a controlled way. Uh, then, then let somebody else do it. We don't want to be the, you know, put the head in the sand and say, you know, that's not coming. And so if, I, if I'm a, a, an employee at Cognizant, I put on my hand, I say, I really want to do this business. Uh, I come to you. What do I get in terms of resources? And how do you help direct me to create a disruptive innovation? So we, we do a couple of things. One, we really try to empower the individual with self-service tools to get started. Prototyping capabilities, education around how lean startup methodologies work, education around business model canvases, right? So give them the ability to take the first couple of steps on their own. Because oftentimes, you know, they, that's what they're really looking for first, is guidance as to how to get started. So we provide that to them as individuals. Beyond that, uh, we do have a system at Cognizant that collects ideas from all 200,000 associates. We call it Spark. Mm -hmm. It's built off of the, the business model canvas for those of you familiar with Eric Osterwalder's mm. book. Um, and we evaluate those ideas. And if we think there's something promising, we will give them a, a, a round of seed funding. Uh, it's not a huge round. It's a small round to get started, to get them off the ground, to get them to that minimum viable product, and to get that first customer on board. So give them an opportunity to find someone else that agrees with their idea. At the end of the day, we look to our customers to validate the ideas because I don't know the retail market space. I don't know the healthcare market space as well as our customers do. So let's let them tell us what they think is a good idea and what's not a good idea. So we just try to get them to that stage. Beyond that, we'll have additional rounds of funding if they found that customer that says, you know what, I agree, That's, that crazy idea is a good one, let's go with it. Got it. And, w and would you seed things even if there wasn't a business champion, or does there have to be a business champion at the Typically stage? we will. Um, we try to find a business champion, and we have a big enough business that we're typically able right. to do so. Um, so we, we haven't had a lot of struggles with that. But if we thought the idea was, was truly disruptive, maybe not that close to our core, but we thought it was something that was important, 
we would still we would still go ahead with it long enough to find that opportunity to get that sponsor. And how long has this been going? And, and could you give us a couple of examples of the kinds of projects that have run through it? Yeah, we we started the the emerging business accelerator in uh, in the beginning of 2012. So we're about three years old. Uh, I would say our efforts have have long predated that. So so really, when we looked at the business, we said, look, let's create a group that specifically focuses on, on cultivating the best practices and making sure we employ them on, on every new initiative that we, we go after. Um, but there, there are stories of, you know, we, we wouldn't have gotten the trajectory of, that we have had it not been for innovators that came long before us. Within the EBA, within that three-year horizon, we do have uh, a, several good bets that I think we've made. Um, we look at practices, uh, we look at a number of different types of practices in the EBA. Uh, we look at new markets practices, so where we don't have a presence, so uh, state and local government is an example where we, we took our services offering, so we took what we knew how to do and went to go serve a new customer base, right? That sat in the EBA because for those of you that have worked with the government, you know that procurement and, and delivering to a government entity is very different than delivering to a commercial entity. Until we built up that muscle to figure out how to do that, we, we set that group up in the EBA. That group has been very successful and will likely graduate from the EBA in the next 12 months or so. Uh, we also have ventures around digital technologies. Uh, all of our digital technologies, SMAC that we spoke about, analytics and mobility and cloud, were, were incubated within the EBA first, right? We gave them the seed to get off the ground and get started. Uh, those have all reached a very sizable critical mass as well. Um, we're still keeping them in our entity because we think there's a lot more room, a lot more potential for them to grow. Um, but we do see them working far outside of the bounds of just what we do in the EBA today. And doesn't, doesn't a business just say, hey, that looks really good. So, Sean, you've got some great traction. I'll give it to us now. How do you, how do you like No, 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 that's mine. I'm keeping so a that lot for of it comes. So some of it comes down to, uh, to double counting, right? We don't necessarily just say, okay. you know, it's mine or yours, right? We give okay. them, if we go deliver a, a mobility project through a vertical, through a, a banking vertical or a healthcare vertical, they get credit for it just like we get credit for it. So there is some of that, but for the most part, we've, we've tried to eliminate and say, look, really what we're looking for is the customer, and we'll figure out how to align incentives to make sure what we're doing is right for the customer. Got it. And, and you mentioned, uh, actually, uh, Michael talks a lot about people and, mm. uh, and attracting and keeping good people. How do you incentivize the folk? I mean, because disruptive folk tend to say, you know, you know what, I, I got a really good idea. There's a lot of bureaucracy here. You know what, I could go make a ton of money outside. I'll go talk to a venture capitalist yeah. or somebody else. And so how do you incentivize people to stay in this all, you know, and, yeah. and work through that seed and up? And yeah. what, what's the... Great secret? question. And it, it's something, it's a, it's, a, it's a struggle we go through every day, right? Finding that right balance between incentivizing the individual. I'd say we do a, a couple of things. One, I think we have a compelling uh, value proposition around why you want to incubate a business with us. So VCs uh, have, have good access to money. Uh, but we also have great access to clients that they won't necessarily have access to, right? We have a thousand clients that you can take your idea. Michael spoke about uh, the ability to swim in this ocean of data, right. right? The ability to get your hands dirty with actual real life examples and real life use cases. We can provide them that in a little bit of a different context, right? But actually getting in front of customers, that's not something you'll necessarily get from the startup world. Beyond that though, uh, we do create separate incentives. Some of it is career trajectory. So if you're in Cognizant, a 200,000 person organization, uh, you may not have a lot of visibility into the senior management team. If you get your venture funded, uh, you're pulled out into this EBA group, which has direct access to our CEO. So I work for our CEO. So you are going from six steps below the guy who runs a Fortune 500 company to two steps below a guy. So you have access to the, to the leadership team during the investment committee mm. meetings. You have access to them for their insights. You have access to people you wouldn't have access to. From a, so from a career trajectory perspective, we try to accelerate that. Beyond that, we have found that there are a set of entrepreneurs out there that if you think about the rewards that an entrepreneur would get as a bell curve, there's entrepreneurs out there that are willing to sacrifice the long tail at the high end, right, those $16 billion payouts for a truncated low end, right? So the, hey, I mortgaged my house and now I'm homeless. So we think if you cut off those ends that there's a, a set of entrepreneurs that like the middle. They want some variability in their payout and we provide profit sharing structures and, and RSUs and things like that to reward them. But in exchange for that, they're willing to, they don't want to give up all that safety on the downside. So that's the, the, probably the third way that we go about doing it. And, and failure, I mean, by definition, if something is really disruptive, you're trying to do something that hasn't been done before, you're going to get a lot of failure. And uh, from my own experience as an entrepreneur, organizations do not like failure. Yeah. They have a bullet, they have a target, and they want you to hit the bullseye, you know, pretty with a great deal of certainty. Yeah. 
How does that work? And then do you, you sort of make these people who, who come up with ideas and they don't work, do you make them heroes when they leave? Pariahs, no, we try to railroad them out altogether. <laughs> no, we, we, do a little bit of, we do a little bit in some cases. Look, we try to separate out uh, the entrepreneur from the venture sometimes. And that's hard to do completely and, and separate the two. But if the person did the right things and for whatever reason the idea just wasn't, did, wasn't getting market, the idea wasn't the right idea at the right time for the right market, uh, we work with them to pivot and try to find what that is. So it's not a one and done, you're out, right? We try to work with them through this, through this discovery process that, that this isn't a straight line growth trajectory. It's a series of steps and missteps that you learn from your mistakes. So right. we try to make sure that they're they're learning, right? They're going through the process of learning as they go and, and reward them for that and highlight that. Sometimes uh, it just doesn't work out and you have to acknowledge that and you have to move on to the next thing. For every one of the people that have committed to the EBA and taken a chance on these new ventures, we have found a place for them back in the business. It's not a guarantee that we give them because you know I think Silicon Valley has shown that there's a lot of uh, power that comes from that working without a net. So we don't guarantee them, but we say, look, if you do the right things, if you demonstrate that you're willing to take risks and be a star, we'll, we'll figure out how to make sure that you're whole at the end of the day. And we've done that every time. Very interesting. I, I have a couple more questions, but I'm, I'm going to open to the floor because I think this is a really interesting area, and I'm sure there's lots of um, thoughts about this. Uh, questions for Sean? There's one up the back there. Hi, my name is Lynn from Taco Bell. Um, you see an amazing amount of disruption across so many industries. Mm -hmm. And my industry has sold taco for 50 years. Hasn't changed, you walk in and you can get a taco. So what do you think I should be worried about over the next you know, couple years in terms of disruption and how that will impact my industry? Yeah, I, uh, I think that's a great question. I think uh, Michael talked a, lot, talked a little bit about friction. And I, I think that that's really the opportunity for disruption in the digital world is where there is friction, how do we eliminate friction? I would say maybe the taco itself hasn't changed, though we talked at dinner last night about your new products and your quesalupas and things like that. So the product is changing. But I think the experience, right? The experience for an individual customer is changing. Um, and, and for Taco Bell, and we work, I think, with, with your parent company, Yum Brands, quite a bit, to figure out where are those friction points for a customer that might be walking by a restaurant, walking by a fast food establishment, how do you get them in the store and through the store quickly to, to experience their, their taco in a different way, right? Get it without that friction that they might have today of waiting online, of, of placing their order, hoping their order is right, getting the order, you know, how do you eliminate those frictions, right? And, and I think improving that customer experience is, is where the disruption is happening. So can you create an environment where the, the taco that they love to eat, you know what it is, you know where they are, and it's there available for them as they walk in without them having to wait, without them having to even order it? And the good news is Lynn hasn't heard about my stealth startup, the great British uh, Yorkshire pudding taco company. <laughs> it's coming for you. Okay, uh, one in the middle here. Hi, uh, Mark Carpenter with Toshiba. So the EBA, I'm just a little curious on the structure of this as well. You talked about you, you want to keep that uh, working without a net uh, feeling and, and motivation. Is there a management structure in place for them? Are they able to operate fully independently? Do they get an advisory board assigned or do they go find them themselves? How, how much leeway do they have? So we, give, so we try to treat every venture as, as a little bit of an independent entity to come back and tell us, look, this is what we think we need. So in some cases, they've gone out and found advisory boards on the outside to help them. And that's usually customer-oriented folks that we've worked with on a, on a regular basis. From a governance perspective, there is the board of directors that I spoke about that has someone from the EBA to help them and someone from other business units to help them as well. So that is the, the oversight governance that they have. And it's there from a strategic perspective. It's there to direct them. It's there to help guide them and train them as to what they're doing. It's not necessarily there to run them as a p and um, For the most part, we've asked each one of the ventures to say, look, what do you define as success? Let's collaborate and let's figure out how we should be thinking about this business. Should it be in terms of a more traditional revenue and profitability? Or is there another key metric that we should be looking at? The number of customers you get access to, the number of conversations, the number of the amount of data you collect, right? Is there a different way we should be measuring this business? And we try to get that oversight board to, to help them with that and to govern them based on that. Um, there is a funding body that's comprised of the CEO of the company and the president of the company and the CFO and the head of strategy of the company. Um, and and the, the individuals that are running their ventures will present to them at times more to kind of educate them about what's going on. Um, but that is how my funding gets justified and how we allocate based on that. So there is sort of a, 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 an executive level, board level group that, that governs the overall EBA. Okay. Uh, any other questions here? 
Well, we saw one, yeah, one up the right hand side. Yeah, just step from there. Thank you. Hi, uh, Christian Johnson from PVTI Consulting. Earlier you mentioned that a lot of the organizations you work with come from the healthcare life sciences sector. What kind of opportunities or excitements do you see um, with your work with those organizations or potential disruptors do you see in the healthcare realm or life sciences realm? Yeah. Uh, look, I think healthcare, uh, and by no means, let me disclaim this, right? I am no, by no means an expert in healthcare and life sciences, though many of our customers are. We, we do work across a lot of industries. But I think healthcare and, and life sciences in general, I think, is undergoing tremendous disruption. Uh, we, I was talking a little bit about this at dinner last night about um, the, the access to information that was never accessible before. So whether that's the data from the Apple Watch, healthcare data from the Apple Watch, or Fitbit information, right? The access to, to look across individuals uh, and predict and, and analyze what is wrong with them as individuals, I think is phenomenal. So um, I think there's tremendous disruption in, in healthcare and life sciences. I think you look at genome sequencing as a great example of the price coming down there. Uh, to look at, at healthcare populations no longer as just populations, but as individuals amongst a population. To look at wellness as opposed to wellness and prevention as opposed to remediation after the fact. I think all of those are opportunities that digital technology helps you fulfill that weren't there before. So I think the opportunities are tremendous. Um, I think the, the industry is, is moving towards disruption. I think it needs disruption. I think most of the, the leading healthcare providers and pharmaceutical companies recognize that. Um, and we work very closely with them around clinical data management, clinical trials, right? What data can you now collect for clinical trials that you were never able to collect before because you were relying on someone to self-volunteer the information as opposed to the monitoring that's now possible? How do you make sure that people are actually taking their medications, right? Huge problem around people getting prescriptions that are either never filled or, or not taken once they are filled, right? You can now create devices and, and technologies to help manage that, right, to help the individual know, oh, it's time to take my medicine and report back to a doctor to say, hey, they are, they are not taking their medicine. So tremendous capabilities that were never there before that, that we are working very closely with our clients to, to realize. Um, Mike, Michael mentioned that, um, you know, Walmart had done 14 uh, acquisitions. Mm -hmm. um, and presumably there's always a sort of build versus buy kind of decision that one could make. So you know, someone comes in with an idea, gets through your um, Sean Shark Tank, yeah. and you say, yeah, great idea, we like it. But, and then you look outside and you say, oh, there are four startups over there doing yeah. this kind of stuff. Why don't we, rather than try to get these guys to do it, let's go buy something that's already got traction. Yeah. How do those discussions work? Do you have a corporate venturing arm at Cognizant? We do, uh, not a corporate venturing arm. I do okay. have a group that we call the Innovation Ecosystem uh, that sits here in Silicon Valley or up there in Silicon Valley um, and monitors what's going on, right? What are VCs investing and what are startups doing? We do, we use that a couple of ways, right? We use that uh, as a way to introduce our clients to new ideas that we might not have, right? But set up right. interactions between clients and startups. Uh, we use that to validate ideas. When somebody comes to us with an idea, we do look outside and say, are there four or five startups that have either been successful or unsuccessful doing this? Can we learn something from that or can we partner or, or buy them? Uh, typically, we do go the partner route first um, because of a lot of reasons, but strategically, there are just technologies that we don't want to own, but we'd much rather partner with other individuals. So we have a very broad ecosystem of partners that we work with in the startup community to create joint solutions to take to the marketplace. Got it, okay. Uh, any other questions? One down here. Hi, I'm Wendy Abel um, with CRTV. Uh, it's actually an online media startup. Um, we've talked a lot about product disruption. Um, can you talk about leadership disruption? So, for example, um, I'm thinking, what are the emerging trends in the leadership roles for digital companies? Do you have any insight into that? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I don't uh, I don't know that I have a, a lot of insight into into the leadership of digital. I, I will tell you this: as I look at digital, um, it's hard it's hard to put it in one bucket of one organization to say it should be a chief information officer responsibility or a chief digital officer responsibility or a chief marketing officer responsibility. I think there's a tendency to try to figure out where you bucket digital. And I, I think what's interesting about digital is that it's not actually, a, as much as we talk about digital technology, it's not about the technology. What we we're doing is empowering the individual. So when we talk about the Taco Bell example, we're empowering that individual consumer to have an experience that they haven't had before. And that cuts across all parts of the organization. So even at Cognizant, we've had a difficult time carving out and saying, hey, this is our digital practice. Because what do you leave out of right. that, right? Do you leave Salesforce integration right. out of that? Do you leave application development? 
what do you leave out? You can't leave anything out of it, right? It is so pervasive across the organization that you're not going to find one person that owns the whole thing, except maybe the CEO, right? Because all businesses, to, to Vijay's point, right? All businesses are software businesses. All businesses are digital businesses. And it's not about finding a digital leader. It's empowering leaders throughout the company to, to have digital competence, to have that digital IQ to lead the organization forward. Because you're not going to centralize it in one individual or one group of individuals. It needs to be pervasive. And, and the kind of metrics you use and are measured by, what, what are they? I mean, do you have like a dashboard and, and what's on that dashboard? As you, from, from the overall EBA? For the overall EBA and digital as a whole for Cognizant. Yeah. So some of it comes down to there, there is, of course, look, we're a publicly traded company and we have revenue and profitability metrics and you can thresholds and things like that. Um, okay. We have to, we have to measure. <laughs> okay. Um, but we do, look, for each individual business, we have, we have metrics for that individual business. And we say, what are we trying to do in, in analytics, for example? Right? Analytics right. and data science is a business that's different for us yeah. than a mobility business, which is more application. Yeah. So we look at the number of the number of data scientists we have, right? The number of engagements we're leading with customers mm. that we we probably wouldn't lead otherwise if we weren't for that that particular practice. Because it's interesting. I mean, picking the right metrics I think is really important. I mean, from the industry I used to be in, uh, media was uh, you're an online media startup. I mean, we used to be measured all the time by number of pages, cost per page. Uh, how many different um, clients you were getting in. And we talked about it and we used that vernacular for a long, long time, even when the whole world was going digital. Mm -hmm. And no one wants to talk about the other metrics because $10 in a print ad came back as $1 online. So that was no good. But it stalled the industry's entire transformation and, you know, and allowed lots of online startups to come away and eat away at the incumbents. So I think having those metrics discussions as well as the leadership clarity, yeah. it's, it's leadership and what is that leadership measuring that is absolutely critical in, in terms of driving a, a, a very successful decision. And I think, you're, I think your point about the metrics discussions are valuable, right? But you can easily, if you, if you try to overreach, you can get trapped in one of those that's metrics. True. And that's the key is to not let yourself get comfortable or trapped in an individual metric and, and look at that number and say, oh, it's, going, it's right. up and to the right, right? Yeah, we're golden, right? It's, yeah. Why is it going up and to the right, and is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? So I think the discussions yeah. are where the fruitful, the fruitful insights come from more than the metric itself. Got it. We have time for one more question for Sean. Uh, there's one down here, sir. Hi, I'm Hema Nathan from Destin House Consulting, and uh, I have a question on process automation. You talked about it earlier. And uh, process automation, we look at the dirty, old petrochemicals and oil and gas industry. What sort of digital disruption do you see in that particular area? Uh, I, I can't comment specifically on petrochemicals. It's not an industry that I, I'm very familiar with. It's actually not an industry that we do a whole lot of work in. But I think in general in process automation, what you're seeing is uh, the access to data and the access to computing power that never existed before is, is creating opportunities for insights, and that insights are leading to automation. So what we look at is we look at uh, robotic process automation, for example, um, things like that to, to drive process automation forward. Um, industrial processes, maybe not as much for us. Um, we look more at knowledge process automation. Okay. I think we are just perfectly on time. Ladies and gentlemen, please would you thank Sean Littleton. Sean. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it.